ahora sí, llega el momento de uno de los puntos más importantes de la agenda. Es un honor tener con nosotros a Peter Diamandis, autoridad mundial en innovación y destacado autor del libro Bestseller Abundance. El doctor Diamandis es un pionero internacional en los campos de la innovación, la competencia por incentivos y el futuro de los viajes espaciales. En el campo de la innovación, Diamandis es presidente y director ejecutivo de la Fundación XPRIZE. Hoy esta fundación lidera a nivel mundial el diseño y operación de competencias globales a gran escala para resolver fallas del mercado. Cofundador y presidente de Singularity University, una institución de Silicon Valley y que asesora a líderes mundiales sobre tecnologías de crecimiento exponencial. Diamandis ha sido destacado por la revista Fortune como uno de los 50 grandes líderes del mundo. Estudió genética molecular, ingeniería aeroespacial en MIT y es además MD de Harvard. El tema que hoy va a abordar la mejor manera de predecir el futuro es crearlo usted mismo. Recibamos con un fuerte aplauso al orador que hoy nos acompaña, el doctor Diamandis. Bienvenido a Guatemala. Lo escuchamos. Which is the idea that one of the most important elements that we as leaders, we as CEOs, as uh, chairman, uh, as, uh, as leaders of nations have, uh, is our mindset. If I were to ask you, what is the most important thing that uh, the greatest leaders of history, uh, the founders of nations, uh, individuals like uh, Steve Jobs or an Elon Musk, what is it that they have that's most important to them? Is it their money? Is it their technology? Is it their friends? Or is it their mindset? I would believe, and hopefully you agree with me, that your mindset is the single most important asset you have. Meaning, um, if you took away one of these incredible leaders, money and technology, but they maintained their mindset, uh, they would rebuild their wealth. They'd rebuild their success to a large degree. And if you agree with me that your mindset, the way that you see opportunities, the way that you handle problems is your most important element, the question is, what mindset do you have? And where did you get that mindset? And more importantly, what mindset do you want? And one of the areas that I study and hopefully you think about, we'll talk about it in this presentation, is the whole field of artificial intelligence, AI. And AI, uh, an area called machine learning, says that if you want to teach a neural net how to recognize something or how to think, you show it example after example after example. And our brains are neural nets. And so the challenge is if our if we're showing our brains negative news all day long from the television or the newspapers that deliver 10 to 1 negative news to positive news your brain is going to get wired for being fearful and scarcity minded. And my job here over these next few uh uh you know this next hour is to help shift your mind from fear and scarcity to abundance and hope. Um, and so I want to share with you uh, reasons for a hopeful abundance mindset. Let me give a little bit of a top line view. So this is an image that looks at data between the year 1820 and 2015. It, it is continuing in this direction. What we've seen is that the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world has dropped from 90% down to uh, now below 10%. And so that's an extraordinary decrease, and it's continuing. So let's continue. Uh, between 1800 and 2016, the number of people who are able to read in the world, who are literate, has gone from 15% to over 80% literacy rate. This is one, I have a, I'm a father of two 11-year-old boys, and so this one is in particular uh, impactful, which is the child mortality rate, the number of children who died below the age of five. Uh, you know, 200 years ago, it was a coin flip. 42% uh, of children born died before the age of five. Today, it's less than 5%. Uh, this is a look at... Um, uh, a look at global life expectancy over the last few hundred years. And what we've seen is that global life expectancy has gone from an average of 30 to over 75. And we'll, we'll speak about this as well. 
Um, this is global access to electricity. We've added a billion people in the last 20 years who have access to electricity. And this is global access to the internet, right? Going from zero 30 years ago uh, to, you know, 80, 90 percent in countries around the world. Um, so the question is, why is this happening? Why are all of these trends moving so rapidly in the right direction? Is it smarter politicians? Is it we humans have gotten smarter? Uh, I would say that the reason, hopefully you agree with me, is it's the impact of exponential technologies, computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, augmented virtual reality. And what we're seeing is that faster, cheaper computers are the bedrock, the foundation upon which all these other exponential tech are being built. And, you know, it used to be that as a entrepreneur, as a CEO, you could build a business on any one or two of these. But today, it's really the convergence of two, three, or four of these that are creating new business models and increasing abundance and opportunity in the world. So when I speak about exponentials, um, you know, what does that mean? And some of you may be graduates of Singularity University, and thank you if you have. I hope uh, you'll consider coming back. And uh, in particular, I run every year something called Abundance 360. It's the highest level program for Singularity. It's in Los Angeles every March. And we talk about exponentials and the impact on our lives. Um, you know, we are all linear thinkers. Our brains are wired to think in a linear fashion. You know, one, two, three, four, five, and 30 linear steps, I am 30 meters away. But when I say, where are you going to be in 30 exponential steps, where an exponential is a simple doubling, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, in 30 doublings, you're not 30 meters away, you're a billion meters away. Put differently, you've traveled around the planet 26 times. And this is what it looks like when I graph it. This red line is all of us. It's our kids, it's our customers, it's our citizens, our politicians. We have not had a hardware or a software upgrade in, you know, in a couple million years. It's been a while. But this yellow line is the technology we're talking about here today. It's computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, and so forth. It's doubling in power every 12 to 24 months. And the difference between this linear thinking and this exponential growth is either disruptive stress, if you're the CEO of a company being disrupted by this technology, or it's disruptive opportunity if you're the entrepreneur creating a breakthrough. So as we talk about creating abundance in the world, I want to share what I consider a very uh, important point. It's something that shifted the way I see the planet and the way I see my work and the companies that I create. And it's the notion that technology is a force that takes whatever was scarce and makes it abundant. Put differently, there is nothing truly scarce on the planet. It's just not in a usable form yet. And I'll come back to that idea. Here's a, a perfect example. What would you think of as more scarce than a perfect diamond? A, a five, seven, eight, 10 carat perfect diamond. Well, um, there is a company, a friend of mine who has a company called the Diamond Foundry, and they are building artificial lab-grown diamonds. So what they're able to do is deposit the carbon layer by layer by layer and create a perfect diamond. Uh, it's not an artificial, it's in other words, it is a diamond. It is made, it looks exactly like a real diamond. It's the exact same molecular uh, uh, matrix. And, you know, the largest jeweler in the world, Pandora, said they're no longer going to sell uh, mined diamonds because of the environmental and human rights costs. And they're only selling these lab-grown diamonds. Let me show you what a actual diamond ring looks like. This would be a diamond ring grown in the lab, layer by layer. Uh, we'll talk about an abundance of energy. Remember, I said the energy is there, just not in a usable form. If you go back 100 plus years ago, 
This was energy. We would go and kill, kill whales to get whale oil to light our nights for, for reading. Then we drilled kilometers into the ground for, uh, or ravaged mountains for coal, oil, and natural gas. Today, we're living on a planet that is bathed in 8,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species. It's not that the energy is scarce. It's just not in a fully usable form. But this is where advances in solar technology are taking us to be able to uh, gain access to those you know, 8,000 times. And what I like to say is that the poorest countries in the world are the sunniest countries in the world and can become the net energy exporters. So uh, here are just some stats for uh, to set what's going on in the United States in 2022, nearly half of all the new solar of all the new energy added to the grid was from solar. Uh, we've seen record highs in wind uh, and brand new deployment of battery factories. There are 13 gigafactories in the US and uh, a large number growing in Europe. And what's driving this progress is that what we're seeing is country after country is making the statement that you could no longer sell internal combustion cars in parts of Europe or China or parts of the US uh, past a particular date. So some nations like Norway and Sweden have said no internal combustion cars after 2035 or 2040. And the car companies are investing hundreds of billions of dollars in electrifying their complete fleets. And that's driving investments in battery technology as well. So the last thing I'll mention in energy besides the renewables is that over the last five years, there have been extraordinary breakthroughs in the area of fusion. And fusion, of course, is what powers the sun 93 million miles away. Um, and we have been pursuing fusion power for the better part of 50 years. And it's always been something manana. It's always been something that's far away. Today, we're seeing a number of fusion companies expecting to have net energy uh, production by 2024 and commercial operations by the end of this decade. And what this means is a massive abundance of energy becoming available. Let's talk about abundance of food, obviously uh, an area of particular uh, uh, import uh, to all of you. Um, but we're going to be changing in part how we produce and distribute food. One of the areas that is on the verge of, um, of very rapid growth is what's called lab-grown meats or lab-grown proteins. Uh, we're seeing this in chicken, in fish, and in beef, where instead of growing the entire cow or the entire chicken or the entire tuna, you grab a few uh, cells, muscle cells, stem cells, and you grow only the meat portion. You don't grow the rest of the animal. And uh, these products are already uh, approved in different countries. The first country to approve this was in Singapore. Uh, we just saw a recent approval by the FDA in the United States. Um, and the reason that this is important is that this food can be produced in downtown Chicago or downtown New York or downtown Nairobi. So this is a direction not for all food, obviously, but for a portion of the protein, because as the world is becoming wealthier and wealthier, more and more people are demanding uh, access to higher quality protein. And we are already uh, one third of the non-ice landmass of the planet is being used for livestock. Uh, another place and way we're producing food uh, in abundance is uh, vertical farms. Uh, this is a company called Plenty that's backed by Walmart, uh, that's building massive indoor vertical farms that are operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is in the Netherlands called Infarm. It's produced 75 different crops. Again, all indoor farming, 24-7 no pesticides, no, you know, um, uh, no uh, lack of water, um, 
perfect temperature, perfect micronutrients. Eco One is the world's largest vertical farm. This is in Dubai, 330,000 square feet, square city blocks. So that's a quick overview of how we're going from scarcity to abundance in different new technologies in food. Now, when is that going to be a substantial percentage of the food production in the world? Not in the next five years, probably not in the next 10 years, but between 10 to 20 years, that kind of technology is going to be built into downtown metropolitan areas. And I just want you to see where things are going. Uh, communications, which is extremely important, again, to all the nations represented here. What we're seeing is a massive global interconnected world. So SpaceX uh, has been deploying its Starlink satellite network, 2,500 satellites on its way now to 30,000 satellites. And these satellites are delivering 100 megabit, soon up to a gigabit connection speed. And it's delivering services to eventually every square meter on the planet. We've heard in particular of the support it's given in the Ukraine. Um, besides that, there's another company which is coming online called eSpace. They're going to be launching 100,000 satellites. And these satellites are uh, going to be providing very low cost, very easy communications from very small sensors. Uh, and then, of course, 5G, our cell phones today. Uh, we We'll have about 3 billion people on 5G by 2025, and this is 100 times faster than 4G. But it doesn't stop there because 6G is also under development. It's 100 times faster than 5G. Uh, put differently, you, know, you can download 142 hours of Netflix in a single second. So all the movies you could possibly want for the rest of the year downloaded in just a second. All right, let's talk about uh, how we're going to be transforming the transportation industry. Um, well, it, we've been talking about this for a while, but it's still progressing. I would have expected it would have been here already, but I think we're going to see it here in the next you know, three or four years. And these are fully autonomous cars that are as safe or safer than human drivers. And so General Motors has a division called Cruise. Uh, they're now operational in San Francisco. Mobileye is operational in Paris. Pony.ai in Shenzhen. Waymo, which is the spin out from Alphabet, uh, Google's parent, is operational in a number of locations. And they've driven over 20 million driverless miles. And of course, Tesla uh, has just released their full self driving beta um, and hopefully will become fully operational by next May. Besides autonomous cars, um, it's going to be what we call flying cars or eVTOLs, electric vertical takeoff or landing. A number of companies that are leading this effort. This is one called Joby. Um, it went public last year for $6.6 .6 billion. This is a multi-copter. It's basically vertical takeoff and then transition on its wing to horizontal flight. Another company called Lilium out of Germany and a company called Archer also went public and has just been uh, demonstrating operational flights in the United States. And then finally, this company called Beta, which has been selling these vehicles mostly for cargo. So I imagine that these kinds of drones will eventually be connecting the rural uh, and urban areas of many nations. It will be transporting crops or medical supplies or individuals to places where there's no roads or very poor road access. Um, and the cost of this is after the capital expense has been paid is really the cost of electricity. All right, um, this is an important part of the presentation that I'm sure we'll have a lot of conversation around. It's one of the meta trends that's gonna impact every one of us. And it's the meta trend of artificial intelligence, the domination of AI, which is coming. So uh, Sundar Pichai, who's a friend, he's the CEO of Alphabet, a sweetheart guy, said it like this, that artificial intelligence could have more profound implications for humanity than electricity or fire. 
And I believe he's correct. Um, Elon put it this way. Uh, he said, basically, companies are going to have to race to build, sorry, companies are going to have to race to build AI or they will be made uncompetitive. Essentially, if your competitor is racing to build AI, they will crush you. It's a little bit more uh, uh, hard statement, but uh, I think it's important. Everybody listening has to be thinking about what is your AI strategy for your government, for your company, for your industry? Uh, this is the way I say it. There are going to be two kinds of companies by the end of this decade. Those companies that are fully utilizing AI and those that are out of business. It's going to be as dramatic as whether you use the telephone or electricity or computers. It's going to be fundamental uh, to all of us. In fact, you know, I mentioned I run Abundance 360 as my um, my highest level summit I do in Singularity every year. It's uh, for about 360 CEOs from around the world. Uh, this year, we've added an entire day on AI because it's that critically important for people to understand how it's going to impact your, your business and your industry and what are the on-ramps? How, how do you start to think about this? Um, let's talk about a few examples. Uh, there's a company called OpenAI. Uh, they built a large language model, a generative pre-trained transformer. It's called, called GPT-3. And GPT-3 has been able to basically search the global internet, which is organized information, and been able to evaluate 175 billion parameters. These are elements of data in the internet. And been able to generate a prediction engine that allows it to predict what should come next in a sentence or next in an image. And so what we've seen is GPT-3 being able to write poems, short stories, blogs, advertisements. I use GPT-3 in my brainstorming sessions with my team. So we'll have GPT-3 open on a computer. And if we're trying to name a new product, I'll ask GPT-3 what it thinks. Uh, and, you know, Seven times out of 10, it's got a better idea than members of my team. Uh, Google has its own large language model called Palm. Uh, GPT-3 was 175 billion parameters. Palm is, uh, is uh, half a trillion. Um, and OpenAI is basically building now uh, GPT-4 with 100 trillion parameters. And GPT-4 is expected to come out sometime in the next year. And this is the way we start to think about getting to human-level AI. So let's talk about a few examples of where this is going. Um, there is another program called DALI. And DALI is another open AI product. And what you do is you give DALI a prompt. You say, create an image for me an image of an armchair in the shape of an armadillo. And based upon just that prompt, this is what Dolly came up with as a set of images. So these are all armchairs in the, in the shape of an avocado. Um, here's another prompt, a living room with two white armchairs and a painting of the Colosseum mounted above a modern fireplace. I'm so impressed by this. Look at this. So this is the AI generating these images based upon two white armchairs, a coliseum above a fireplace. I mean, it's extraordinary. And it will generate a hundred different variations of this for you. Other areas that GPT-3 is being used, uh, Microsoft invested a billion dollars into open AI and got access to using GPT-3 for doing speech to code. So imagine you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you don't know how to code, uh, do computer coding. It's been many years since I've done computer coding. Instead, you can speak to the AI and you can basically say, write me a, a program that takes these parameters and outputs this result, right? You can describe verbally through speech what you want. And the 
GPT-3 algorithm will convert your desire, your intention into computer code. It's called a no-code application. Meta, previously Facebook, is using AI to do translation between 200 different languages. Of course, AI is being used in the medical arena, uh, being able to detect cancer, uh, lung cancer, Alzheimer's, uh, you know, with 99% better accuracy than human physicians. This is where Ray Kurzweil predicts AI will be. Ray is my co-founder of Singular University, considered one of the top thinkers on the planet in the field of artificial intelligence. He made this prediction a while ago, and he's been sticking with it, that by 2029, AI will have reached human-level intelligence. What that means is that by 2030, it's now greater than human level. Uh, this is what Elon said. He said, by 2025, vast, vastly smarter than a human uh, by 2025. So what's that mean for you, your business, your industry, when we start to have AI uh, being able to basically outperform some of your top employees? How are you going to use it? How are you going to integrate this? All right, let's talk about the field of robotics and the meta trend of robots, which of course is another way of saying the future of different forms of labor. So one thing I'm watching very carefully is we're heading towards fully roboticized surgery. So it used to be that if you're wealthy and you needed a very special kind of surgery, you could hop on an airplane and fly to the Cleveland Clinic or whatever it might be and get the best surgeon in the world. In the future, the best surgeon in the world is going to be an AI and a robot that has seen every variation out there. Uh, take a look at this. This is uh, a robotic avatar called Beyond Me. And there is a human wearing a VR helmet and a haptic suit. And as that human controls the robot, uh, the robot Apologies, uh, I had a power, had a power glitch over here. Um, uh, may I ask you uh, what was the last uh, portion you saw? Yeah, you were just um, about to show the 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 the, the, the robot. Amica. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will. I will join back there again. Apologies to everybody. Um, okay. Just. Uh, Okay, um, so uh, this is uh, a robot called Amica uh, that was uh, the star of my show at uh, Abundance 360 last year. Let's take a look at her. So Amica is uh, an extraordinary robot showing uh, uh, a wide range of emotions. Uh, she's driven by GPT-3 uh, when needed to. Uh, but you can see a direction of where things are going. And as I mentioned uh, before I was disconnected, the other announcement that was a major announcement this year uh, came from uh, Tesla, Tesla bot. Let's take a, a listen to Elon here. Optimus production unit one, uh, which is the ability to move uh, all the fingers independently, uh, move the, uh, to have the, the thumb have uh, two degrees of freedom, uh, so it has opposable thumbs, and uh, both left and right hand. So it's able to operate uh, tools and do useful things. Our goal is to make um, a, a useful humanoid robot as quickly as possible. Optimus is designed to be an extremely capable robot, but made in, in very high volume, probably ultimately millions of units, um, and it, it, it is expected to cost much less than a car. I would say probably less than $20,000 would be my guess. This means uh, a future of abundance, a future where um, there, there is no poverty, where people, you can have whatever you want in terms of products and services. Um, it really is a, a, a fundamental transformation of civilization as we know it. So I find that fascinating 
Uh, if, in fact, he's correct in being able to do that for $20,000, you can imagine the marketplace for those robots uh, is much bigger than the, the marketplace for a car. Um, uh, an area that I focus on uh, a lot is the future of the abundance of health. Uh, it's an area that I'm very passionate about. Uh, and one, I think there's no greater gift you can give anybody than uh, extra years of a healthy life. Um, we're seeing amazing transformation going on today. Um, it was originally the ability to sequence your genome, all 3.2 billion letters of your life, cost about $3 billion. Today, it's $200. It took previously years. Today, it can be done in seven hours. And the ability to understand your genome uh, is the ability to understand what's wrong and to a large degree how to fix it. One of the other technologies coming online is CRISPR, gene editing. Uh, this is won the Nobel Prize in 2020 to amazing women. And your ability to go into your genome, the 3.2 billion letters from your mother and your father, and if there is a genetic problem, like in this case, this particular uh, amyloidosis that kills you know, half a million people a year, you can go into your liver and edit the genome and not uh, treat the disease, to cure the disease. It's extraordinary in that regard. Um, we're seeing the ability to cure congenital blindness, to cure thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. This is a revolution in being able to cure genetic diseases across the board. Another biotech revolution occurring right now is the ability to create a backup set of organs for everybody. So this is a company that is able to edit the genome of pigs. It turns out that pigs have the same size heart, liver, lung as humans do. And so you're able to go into these pigs, edit the genome of the pigs to have the same surface cell antigens, and then grow a pig and being able to transplant that heart or liver or lungs or kidneys into the human uh, recipient. Uh, this is a gentleman, a dear friend of mine by the name of Dean Kamen who has uh, built a company called ARMI, the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute. And ARMI has built a incredible, call it a 3D printer. In one end goes uh, a few induced pluripotent stem cells that then are grown and differentiated. Now at the other end comes an organ two months, three months later. So we're really talking about a future of a abundance of organs if you need a heart or lung or liver transplant. Is it here today? It's just beginning. Will we see this in the next five to 10 years? Absolutely. But I think a lot of the excitement in the field of health is around the idea of understanding why we age and maybe why we don't have to. So how do we slow down, stop, and even reverse the aging process in the body? Uh, this is work done by Dr. Belmonte uh, in, at Salk in San Diego, who's been able to reverse aging in elderly mice. We're seeing this work now going into dogs and eventually into humans. This is what's going on in uh, human skin, not on the human, but in the, in the dish, in the lab, but we're seeing the ability to reverse aging in the lab uh, by, you know, 30 years or more. So again, pretty extraordinary work. It is quite possible. Let me uh, take a second and set this up. Every year, I take a group of uh, about 40 of my Abundance 360 members on a special platinum trip. And on one year, we go to the West Coast of the U.S., San Francisco and San Diego. On the other year... Uh, we go to uh, Boston, Cambridge, New York, New Jersey, and we visit the top tell, top stem cell scientists, genetic scientists, the top entrepreneurs. And um, George Church and David Sinclair, who you'll see in this video, are who we're going to go be visiting this coming August and September. But listen to what they have to say. And how do you think about this for your personal life, for your family, for your business? How is it going to affect the way you see the world? Listen carefully. 
It is quite possible that some of the people in, uh, alive today will, will see no upper limit. Imagine having a treatment, perhaps a viral uh, delivery of these three genes when you're 45, everything's good, you reach 50, biologically you can measure that, uh, and then you get a course of doxycycline, three weeks later, uh, many if not all parts of your body are rejuvenated, uh, and then you reset the clock. And you reset the clock, how would you like that? I mean, a lot of the work that I'm working on right now, most of my companies I'm starting, uh, I have a, a half a billion dollar investment fund that I invest a lot, two thirds of it into this area. Uh, the economic impact is massive. This was a study done at Harvard, Oxford, and London School of Business that said, if we can slow the aging process and increase life expectancy by just one year globally, it's worth $38 trillion to the global economy. So uh, let me wrap here and we'll go to Q&A um, by saying, uh, I think a few important statements that the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. This is what I'm in the boardroom of companies saying, you know, if you can identify a great, big, juicy problem, whether it's energy, food, water, healthcare, shelter, it is uh, the biggest business opportunities on the planet. Uh, and that the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. Uh, if you would like uh, a copy of these slides, if you just uh, click on that, I put out a weekly tech blog every week, actually twice a week on where these technologies are going. And uh, I'm just completing now a series of the top 20 meta trends for the decade ahead. What are the top 20 meta trends that will shape every country, every industry? Uh, and uh, again, that link will allow you to get access to the meta trends and to my tech blog. Uh, and I welcome you. I would love to get uh, a connection and spend more time uh, with. Uh, with all of you. All right, um, Juan Carlos, uh, a pleasure. I'd love to do our Q&A now. All set? Peter, thank you very much for this journey. Uh, I think that the presentation and all what you have said has been very important for us, especially that you, you are being watched in three countries at the same time, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, uh, almost 2,000 people. Well, and also people that are streaming this online. So thank you very much for, for the presentation and the opportunity. I had a couple of questions. Uh, when we talk about different challenges for countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and other developing countries, uh, there are always institutional challenges that undermine different efforts, specifically towards infrastructure, uh, topics like education, health, technical training, or even rule of law, um, what would you recommend to different leaders, specifically from the private sector, we have a lot of people from the private sector today, to engage more towards institutional strengthening in our countries? So, again, I, I think really the, the question in, in these three nations is, um, uh, Fundamentally, what will the nation be focused on and known for? Uh, what is the most? I, I when I when I am you know working with uh, heads of of companies, industries, and even nations, one of the things I talk about is uh, what is your massive transformative purpose? What is the brand that the nation wants to have? Where do you want to play the best in? Um, and it's not doing everything for everyone, 
It's when when I think of Guatemala, when I think of El Salvador, when I think of a nation, what is it that I think is the most what's what does that what is that nation going to uh, be the best at and and known for around around the world? And how do I uh, how do I support the educational system? How do I support the incentive programs? How do I support the industrial base to be able to further those core areas. Um, we're living in a global economy where you can buy anything you want from from almost anywhere. And so there's a flattening of the curve in that regard. Uh, but for any any company or any country being clear about this is who we are, this is what we're the best at, uh, and this is where we're going to outcompete everybody is such a critical part of the equation. Now, it's one of the advantages that a small, relatively small nation has is the ability to establish a um, uh, a regulatory advantage over other countries. Um, and I'll give an, a simple example in saying we're going to be the country that is uh, the most advanced uh, in drones. And the government is going to pass the laws allowing for drone flights to occur any place. We're going to make investments in drone companies. We're going to buy drone services, and we're going to become the centerpiece. So the ability to say, this is the place that's the most important for us, and we're going to bring regulatory, financial incentives, educational incentives, and so forth. But you can't do it every place. It's like, what is the nation need to be uh, the best known in? And then it's about about focus in that regard. Hopefully that is meaningful. Uh, and that's very important because, uh, for instance, in countries like Guatemala, we have uh, focused on manufacturing, but also call centers, PPOs, and also electronics in, in other areas such as pharmaceuticals. So I think it's, it's very important what you're saying to try to incentivize those sectors. Uh, it's also true for El Salvador and Honduras. They're also focusing a lot on mega trends and how to focus on innovation. So I think that's very important. And do you think, is there uh, any specific initiative or innovation that you have uh, seen in Singularity University uh, or efforts that you work on that would help countries in Central America to accelerate its innovations and to the communication systems. Um, we were just talking right now about your program. Uh, what do you think would be specific for, for the three countries in Central America to focus on I mean, what you're already doing? So uh, again, it's it really is about focus. And so the first the decision is what is, you know, uh, what is the, the area that we're gonna focus in on. And then it's a matter of bringing in, a, in either identifying the individuals in the country or bringing people there. Um, there was a uh, uh, a program years ago uh, in Chile called Startup Chile, where they were offering up a $50,000 incentive to any entrepreneur that would move down uh, there and would bring their company or company ideas. And ultimately, it's about bring, it's either educating the existing uh, base of individuals or bringing people to get a critical mass because its intellect is 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 key, and then married with um, married with the regulatory uh, support and and in capital. So one of the things that I've done, I run an organization called the X Prize Foundation, and we do large scale global competitions. Um, so uh, we have run uh, competitions around the world where, uh, let me give an example, we ran one competition in Greece for ocean mapping. And we asked teams around the world to build technology that could map uh, the ocean floor off the coast of Greece at 4,000 meters depth. And um, we offered up, I forget how much, it was a $5 million competition or thereabouts. And then we had teams, you know, hundreds of teams building technology to meet that goal. So one 
approach to driving innovation is if you're clear about what you want to achieve uh, and can create a very clear finish line, you can launch a global incentive competition and invite innovators around the world to come to you to demonstrate how they would solve that problem. Um, so we've launched about $300 million in X prizes to date. Uh, and another $300 million will be launched over the next uh, few years. Um, so I think that's an important one. The other side of innovation I would just mention is, uh, it's, a, it's a tough one, that a lot of times real innovation, real breakthroughs do not occur within the established companies or, or the existing leadership. It happens from the outside. Uh, example is in the space business, which I know very well. Uh, you know, the industrial military complex in the US, companies like Boeing and Lockheed and Northrop Grumman, they were not the ones who created the breakthroughs in launch vehicles. It was Elon and Jeff Bezos who were completely outside the industry. So, one of the questions becomes how do you innovate at the edge if you're a company that wants breakthrough innovation, a lot of times doing that inside the company is very difficult because there's an immune system that stops the breakthroughs, the crazy ideas from occurring. Uh, it has to occur on the edge, on the outside. Maybe it occurs in the universities, maybe it occurs in, in separate projects. You know, when Steve Jobs created the Macintosh it was not done inside of Apple. It was done in a separate building, miles away, away from all of the main individuals, because people don't like to see the area that they've known forever get disrupted. Um, and like I said, if the day before something is really a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea, where inside your organizations are you trying crazy ideas? Uh, otherwise, you're stuck in incremental progress, not disruptive progress. That, that's a very important message, specifically when you talk about how do you bring abundance mentality to a whole country. So that's, yeah. that's very important. Uh, so, uh, now, in, uh, in Central America, we, we have been through some of your programs uh, to spur innovation and growth, uh, focus on small and medium-sized enterprise in Guatemala, for example. Uh, we have been working with a scale-up program uh, with the University of Madison, focused on productivity and also trying to increase clients and, and income, especially to increase cash flow. Uh, what opportunities for innovations in technology would you recommend the entrepreneurial ecosystem in our region, specifically focused on SMEs? Because one of the largest challenges of all three countries is how to generate more employment, specifically to not have so much migrants towards the U.S., uh, which makes it something that is uh, important for both regions. Um, so if you could focus on SMEs, what would your recommendation be? Well, I, I, again, I think uh, we're living in we're living on a planet that's changed in the last two years where uh, there's a, a large effort for uh, onshoring uh, supply chain, but a full acceptance of offshoring uh, talent. Um, and of course, this is where call centers and technology centers can provide services. I mean, the cost of engineering in the U.S. is extremely high. And so a lot of the engineers that I hire are from uh, South America, uh, Central America, uh, used to be Ukraine, now Poland, uh, and and Philippines, um, and you know. So one of the questions is: Can can there be a uh, uh, the creation of talent pools that are uh, that are fully capable of delivering the types of services that are uh, desired, but delivered over over Zoom, over Slack, over these sort of the the tele the 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 teleemployment uh, capabilities that's now fully accepted because you know so many of my employees I don't know where they live um, I just know I see them on Zoom or I see them on on email and that's and that's uh, totally that's totally fine um, I mean the realization is we're going to see AI playing a critical role and 
uh, I think every SME needs to be thinking about uh, about about this. I I teach something, uh, Juan Carlos, that I talk about that every company needs to think about how do they digitize, dematerialize, demonetize, and democratize their products and services. Because ultimately, somebody is going to be trying to do that. Um, you know, Kodak, uh, which made all the film and the cameras, uh, they developed the first digital cameras, but they failed to take advantage of it. And then you saw Instagram and many others take advantage. But when that when photography was digitized, it dematerialized the camera, got rid of the camera, and then it it demonetized it. It was effectively free and democratized it around the world. And so uh, the challenge is, you know, how do you think about doing that for your own products and services? Your marketplace goes beyond local to global when it's digital. Um, and I think that's just a fundamental question that every CEO needs to be asking. Thank you. Uh, and just for lack of time, I, I would just like to ask one last question. Yeah, please. Uh, you walked us through uh, the impact of technology in many, many areas, food, transport, energy. How about the future of money itself? Uh, we have a question from El Salvador uh, on digitization of currencies, fintech, cryptocurrencies. Do you have any impression on that attempt uh, to get a head start in that area in yeah. El Salvador? What would you do? Sure. So listen, I am... I'm a huge believer in Bitcoin uh, and a huge fan of uh, the leadership that El Salvador uh, demonstrated uh, in its adoption there. I think it's still early days, but I think the ability to have digital currencies that accelerate the movement of money, which is energy, um, uh, is extremely important. I think where we go next is going to be uh, digitizing uh, land and uh, asset ownership, uh, being able to have uh, credible ownership, but also being able to transact the ownership rapidly. Um, I think it. I think that a country's uh, currency and ownership structure uh, makes it uh, much safer for external financial investment by uh, outside players. And so I'm, um, again, a huge fan of what El Salvador did there. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Peter. I'm sure we will have more questions, more comments. Uh, I'm sure many people scanned the link that you sent. Uh, so it has been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Uh, and we hope to soon have you here in Guatemala physically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Look forward to meeting you in person. Be well.